snap. The kick is in the air, and the kick this time is no sir Ree. No sir Ree. Final score, Tennessee 20, Florida 17. Pandemonium reigns. You're listening to the RTI Podcast, powered by WalkingTopInsider.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome in to another episode of the RTI Podcast. I am Nathaniel Rutherford, Managing Editor of RockyTopInsider.com, joined again, as always, by our staff writer here at RTI, Ben McKee, and he's also the producer and co-host of the Swain Event morning radio show on uh, the Swain Event app, 7 to 10 a.m. every single morning, Monday through Friday. Ben and Vol fans listening, it is the first RTI podcast of, uh, I guess, game week, game day, uh, game day eve, however you want to look at it. It's, it's game week this week. This is the first one before Tennessee plays an opponent in the 2019 season. It's finally here, Ben. We're recording this on Thursday afternoon uh, around 4-something in, in the afternoon, so it is less than 48 hours away from kickoff. We've finally, you know, essentially made it through the long off season, there was actually football last week when we we got to see Florida and Miami. Um, so football has actually been here, but football will be in Tennessee here in less than 48 hours. And depending on when you're listening to this, could be less than 24, could be less than 12, just depending on when you're listening to the podcast here. Ben and I are gonna we're gonna break down Georgia State just a little bit, um, but as we all know, the the Panthers they're not a great team. Uh, Tennessee should be able to go out there and handle their business and, and win by. 20, 30, 40 points in this game. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time breaking down Georgia State and breaking down, you know, what the Vols got to do to win. I mean, the, the keys to victory in this one are, are pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Tennessee's bigger, faster, stronger in, in most areas uh, than Georgia State. I think their their biggest defensive lineman doesn't weigh over 290 pounds. So Tennessee should be able to have their way up front. But then again, Ben, we, we saw last year against, you know, teams like UTEP and Charlotte, uh, Tennessee didn't quite have their way up front. So that's going to be, that, that will be one thing we'll watch. We'll kind of get to that in a second of, as far as, you know, things we want to see from Tennessee. But from a Georgia State perspective, Ben, this is a team that, similarly to Tennessee, they do return a lot of production on both sides of the ball. Tennessee is more kind of concentrated on offense, but they do return some key players on defense. With Georgia State, they return a, a really good dual-threat quarterback who is a former junior college guy in Dan Ellington. They have a, a very competent rushing attack. That's going to be Ellington led them in rushing last year, like I said, as the dual-threat quarterback. But they also have a duo of good running backs back there who are, are speedy and shifty. They don't have a big receiving core, but they have a, 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 a speedy receiving core of, of guys who are around five. Their smallest guy, who I think actually will end up playing a decent amount, is five foot seven. but they do also have a six foot four guy. So they have mostly under six feet tall. Uh, I think three of their main four receivers are under six feet tall, but they do have a six foot four guy who, you know, they can throw the ball up to and a, a tight end who was banged up a little bit last year. It looks like he's healthy this year. Defense is, well, Ben, it's it's really bad. It, you want to look back at, you know, how bad Tennessee's rushing defense was a couple of seasons ago. That's how bad Georgia State's rushing defense was last year. Uh, they gave up a total of just over 3,000 rushing yards to an opponent's last year, 30 rushing touchdowns. I think there was only, I think it was, what, four games last season where they held opponents to under 200 yards rushing, um, and, and they had a couple games, or several games where they had 300, 400 rushing yards they allowed in a, in a, in a game. And then they weren't that great in, in, in the passing defense either. They only picked off six passes all season long. They were tied with a couple teams for the second fewest turnovers forced in the entire season. Last year, they still had multiple instances of of 250 plus yards passing against them, even though they're also giving up a, t- a bunch of rushing yards, uh, they they allowed 26 passing touchdowns. Overall, as a, as a defense, they allowed. I'm trying to find the stat here. I, I wrote it down. They allowed in the 12 games last year. They allowed their opponents to score 40 or more points five times in the 12 games, and opponents scored 34 or more points in all but two of the 12 games they had they played last season. Obviously, like I said, they returned a lot of of you know, production from last season. A lot of those those defensive woes, especially, were was because tennis, or excuse me, because Georgia State was playing a lot of younger guys. So they'll have guys, you know, another year older, another year experienced, another year stronger. But Ben, it's not gonna matter, right? I mean, it, this is a this is a team where I, I'm curious in your thoughts on Georgia State. If there's a guy that 
I think besides obviously the quarterback because he's getting most of the attention because he's a dual threat guy who almost accumulated 3,000 yards of offense last season. But I'm curious if there's another guy you're kind of circling as one for Tennessee fans to watch out for and just, you know, kind of your thoughts on, on Georgia State in general. Uh, that they're not very good <laughs> and that uh, they don't have the athletes to to keep up with Tennessee. Now, they do have some impressive football players, mm-hmm. but as a team – they don't have the guys. They don't have a team full of guys that should compete with Tennessee on, on Saturday. If it is true that Craig Fitzgerald has completely transformed, um, I won't say completely because Tennessee still has a ways to go. But if it is true that Craig Fitzgerald has taken a big step forward with the team in the weight room, changing bodies, adding muscle, cutting out body fat, and, and things of that nature, and you know, you pair that with some big time freshmen coming in that are expected to make plays this season, and pair them with good coaching. Tennessee absolutely has good coaching on its coaching staff. It just hasn't necessarily had a chance to to show that just yet. So, um, I would be surprised if, if this is a close game because Georgia State doesn't have a team full of dudes that can compete with Tennessee. Now they do have a couple of guys who stand out, obviously. Uh, the the main one is Dan Ellington, the the Georgia State quarterback, who was an all belt all Sun Belt conference honoree uh, last last season. He was a true dual threat quarterback. He led Georgia State in passing with 2,119 yards, and also led the team in rushing with 625 yards, and scored 17 touchdowns. He's a former ju- junior college All American, uh, and ranked third in the Sun Belt in passing averaging 192.6 yards per game. And his five interceptions last season were the fewest by Georgia State starting quarterback in program history. Now, Georgia State is only in its ninth season at the Division One level, went 2-10 mm. and last year. So uh, I'll be honest with you. If you just gave me Dan Ellington's stats, didn't tell me what team he was on, and, and told me to kind of, what team do you think this kid plays for? I would not have picked a 2-10 and ten football team. This kid seems like he's pretty productive in the sense of, yeah, his numbers aren't monstrous in terms of passing yards and, and t- passing touchdowns. Uh, just 12 passing touchdowns, just 2,000 passing yards. Kind of reminds me of Jerry Garantano. Yep. And, and so it kind of tells me that, okay, maybe he doesn't have any playmakers around because he didn't turn the football over. I mentioned his five interceptions being the fewest by a Georgia State quarterback in program history. That kind of tells me that he's in the same situation as Jared Carantano, and outside factors are the reason the team was unsuccessful last year at 2-10. and 10. So I do think he is a guy that can present problems for Tennessee. Uh, and, you know, I, honestly, I'm worried about Tennessee's defense. Will it matter this week against Georgia State? No. Will it matter week three against uh, UTC? No. But – it will matter against BYU. I'm actually very high on BYU's offense, and I am am very interested to see. uh, Well, I guess a side note, we are recording this on Thursday afternoon. Uh, It'll probably, this podcast will probably come out tonight or first thing Friday morning, but BYU and Utah are playing Thursday night. Utah is a a dark horse to make the college football playoffs, and part of that is because uh, of Utah's front seven, have one of the best defensive lines in the country, one of the best front sevens in the country. So I am very high on BYU's offense, as I said, so I am interested to see them go up against a legitimate defense, quite frankly, a defense that is better than Tennessee's tonight. I, I think that will be a good test for them. And BYU has a strong offensive line. Uh, their left tackle and their center are sophomores this year. Last year, as true freshmen, uh, Pro Football Focus ranked them as the top two freshman offensive linemen in the entire country hmm. they they have depth that receiver I, I believe they return eight of their top 10 pass catchers um uh, and one of them is their star tight end have a quarterback I, I don't know how i got on a tangent on byu i apologize for that we're talking about Georgia state but my point is i am concerned about tennessee's defense uh and it won't matter against georgia state but dan ellington georgia state's quarterback is a guy who could although tennessee is far superior to georgia state could lead a touchdown drive or two. It would not surprise me to see Georgia State in the 10- to 14-point range uh, because of my concerns on the defense and because of Dan Ellington's uh, a true ability. To, I mean, he's a true dual-threat quarterback. He can hurt you with his arm. He can hurt you with his legs. Can his teammates kind of give him some time, make some plays 
on the outside. And just to real quick, just to give a little explanation as to why I am saying I am concerned about Georgia State or Tennessee's defense. That is, uh, is because yes, Aubrey Solomon is great news. That is mm-hmm. huge news for Tennessee. Uh, it could be the difference in Tennessee winning just one more football game. It, it really could. But even with Aubrey Solomon, Tennessee still lacks depth and proven playmakers along the defensive line as of right now. Uh, Daniel Batuli has a lingering knee issue. Hopefully that uh, will not be a lingering knee issue come BYU next week. But even past Daniel Batuli, I love Henry Toa Toa, but he's a first-time starter. Uh, he's a true freshman. I think he's going to do great things, but let's see how he responds with, with live bullets flying. You have Will Ignat. He's somewhat experienced, but he still has a lot to prove. Shannon Reed has a lot to prove. Uh, J.J. Peterson obviously has a lot to prove. Uh, Jeremy Banks is on the on the defensive side of the ball right now. He has a lot to prove. So outside of Darrell Taylor and Daniel Batuli, linebacker depth is a concern right now. And then the secondary has, has really – been a call or or a reason for concern for me personally the last couple of days in the sense of just me thinking about Tennessee football because I I like Nigel Warrior and Trevon Flowers and Alante Taylor but after that it's like who is Tennessee going to throw back there yes you have Warren Burrell and the reason I didn't mention him with the other three is simply because he is a true freshman and he has not played in a college football game yet he has been very impressive this fall camp and I don't think this will happen but um, theoretically, he could get thrown in there into an actual game, and he could drown instead of floating. So I don't think that will happen. I think he's going to show out. Um, but the depth at corner after those guys, I mean, you're relying on Kenny Solomon and Kenneth George and Gerard Means, three guys who haven't played any football for Tennessee and one who is a converted wide receiver and doesn't have long-term plans to stick in the secondary. So uh, sorry for the long-winded answer, but uh, and when you ask kind of, what guys stand out offensively for me it's Dan Ellington a true dual threat quarterback and with some of the concerns on Tennessee's defense that I have he could lead a touchdown drive or two simply because of some depth issues and again it's not enough to where he's going to lead Georgia State to this humongous upset win but I could see him generating seven to ten points on Saturday yeah and we have actually done a podcast you and I um, together since the Ari Solomon and Trey Smith news happened so that's two we have really good pieces of news for Tennessee that we both, I think we both would agree, Ben, that it can change the outcome of of how we feel about Tennessee's respective, you know, the two units with the most question marks in the, the defensive line and offensive line. O- obviously, Solomon's clear for the whole season, uh, barring any sort of injury for him, he, he's going to play probably in all 12 regular season games and, and for Tennessee's sake, hopefully the 13th in the bowl game. Trey Smith, however, it, it's going to be more week to week. Uh, Pruitt and Smith didn't outright say that in the statement that was released uh, by the University of Tennessee when they announced that he was cleared to play in the season opener um, on on Tuesday. But the wording of how what they said, the wording of the release, that, that it's very much being made out as, "Hey, this is going to be a week to week thing." And I think that's 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 just very true. I mean, it was week to week last year for Trey Smith, and it, it wasn't made maybe as public but then I mean they the doctors and stuff were still examining him because if they weren't they wouldn't have found the blood clot issue before the South Carolina game so obviously they were still examining him week to week last year that's that's what it's going to be this year but still two good pieces of news for Tennessee you would like to to hope and think that Trey Smith can play the entire season and if he does even if he's not back up to the all-american status that he that he was as a true freshman he's still probably Tennessee's best offensive lineman and I, I think Obviously, Wanya Morris and Donor Wright have really high ceilings, but they're true freshmen. Uh, and not every true freshman is going to be the All-American type of true freshman that Trey Smith was. But even Trey Smith, as an All-American true freshman, made mistakes and, and was, you know, wasn't was perfect. So I think with him being a junior and him being – you know, he stayed very well in shape, and, and Pruitt mentioned that um, either on vol calls or on, his, on a teleconference or on his presser. He, he talked a lot on Tuesday of this week. He was on three separate things where he was talking uh, to the media. But he mentioned in, in one of those media sessions that um, when, when they first got there, Smith was around 360, 365 in weight, and now he's down to 320 in a healthy 320. So he, he's in really good shape. So if he's if he stays, you know, if he's able to play all year, you imagine that um, he's going to be a big difference maker on Tennessee's offensive line. And, and, and Ben, I think both the conversations we're just having kind of fit directly it makes it a good make a good transition to our next topic here because, like I said, we don't want to break down Georgia State too much because there's just 
you know, not a lot to break down. We don't want to waste your time and make it make make a, a a subpar team sound like world beaters. That's Jeremy Pruitt's job. It's his job to make every single opponent Tennessee's going to play sound like they're going to contend for a national championship. Um, that's not our job. Our job is to tell you like it is and let you know, hey, this team sucks, and Tennessee should be able to go out there and beat them by multiple touchdowns and you know have it pretty much put away by halftime. But Ben. I want to talk about some things that we want to see from Tennessee this weekend um, on, on the football field. I think, to me, I, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, talking about Tennessee's woes against teams like UTEP and Charlotte last year. Granted, this is a like I said, this is a team that doesn't have a defensive lineman who weighs more than 290. It, this is not going to be a tune-up for maybe even BYU, but it's definitely not going to be a tune-up for what you're going to face in the SEC this season with the likes of what Florida's front seven looks like, what Alabama's front seven looks like. Uh, it, what Mississippi State's front seven looks like too. They have they have a pretty good front seven. This is not going to be a tune up for that. But like I said, Tennessee struggled last year. They struggled in in 2017 to to force their will on these inferior opponents. I think one of the the top things I want to see from this weekend, and we'll kind of go back and forth. I'll give one, you give one, and then I'll give another, and you give another. But I think one of the top things I absolutely want to see this weekend is can Tennessee just you know have their way on the offensive line. Can Tennessee go out and average five, six, seven yards per carry um, with the running backs because the offensive line is actually able to go and enforce their will on the front seven of Georgia State and make a statement? Can can they open up holes for Ty Chandler and Tim Jordan and Eric Gray? Can they get these guys to you know, not be hit in the backfield and have to fight their way forward just to gain positive yards? And we saw that so many times last year where the running back was hit right behind or right at the line of scrimmage, and it, it was up to him to gain any yardage. It was up to him to turn a negative into a positive, and, you know, obviously a lot of times that didn't happen. Tennessee, I think, had gave up like 94 or 90-something tackles for loss last season, and, you know, they didn't give up as many sacks, but, man, they were absolutely putrid in, in run blocking last season. That's going to be my thing. I, I, I do think they'll have a, a decent time and be able to project, uh, protect Jerry Garantano in this game especially. Georgia State doesn't have a, a very vaunted pass rush uh, necessarily, but and they were—I mean—they were terrible defending the run last year. I don't expect them to be much better. I, I want to see Tennessee get, you know, 300 rushing yards in this game. I, I will be a little disappointed if they don't. Obviously, if they get, you know, like 250 and they're averaging six, seven yards per carry, that's that's going to be fine. But in, in, in I guess just I'm trying to think what the word I'm trying to use here. But essentially, I, I'm wanting to see Tennessee just have a, a dominant run performance in this game because you don't need Jarrett Garantano to throw for a bunch of yards in this game. You don't want to give away too much for BYU or too much for Florida. So you're probably going to be a little more conservative in your play calling of this one. I want to see Tennessee's offensive line just, you know, be dominant like they should be in this game. That's kind of the number one thing I'm going to be watching for this weekend. Yeah, and, and mine is essentially the same thing. I mean, really, the, there's only two things that I'm either going to, to over – essentially just overreact on. Uh, one, whether it be positively – or negatively, and, and that's the play of the offensive line and the defensive line. Uh, I, I think they they are going to be very vanilla in order for them not to show too much for BYU, for Florida, as you just mentioned. Um, and, and as a result, I don't know that Jared Garantano may put up the gaudy stats that folks want him to put up. Um, I'm not saying he's going to throw 100 yards and one touchdown. I, I think he'll be in the, the 250, three touchdown range, which is very good, but you know, I mean, the highlight of this week has been the talk of Tyler Bray's 2012 game in which he threw for over 300 yards on 20, on 18 of 20 passing for 310 yards to be exact and four touchdowns. I don't think he'll put up those numbers just because I do think the offense is going to be vanilla. But the one thing that I do think that we will be able to take uh, a firm judgment from is the play of the offensive line. And, and, you know, maybe the jury will still be out just a little. We shouldn't write in stone how good they will perform this season but I do think the offensive line will be very telling um, based off of how they perform or our, our, our expectations for what they should do this year um, will be very telling based off of how they perform against Georgia State because we've seen it in years past the last two years the offensive line has not been good uh, and it was evident early on when they performed very poorly against teams like UMass and teams like East Tennessee State and, and Charlotte. So uh, if the offensive line comes out and struggles against Georgia State based off of history and what recent trends tell us, I'm going to assume that the offensive line is going to struggle 
going forward. Uh, now, I will say, and maybe this is not fair of me to do, but I, I do think it's fair in my own personal opinion is that if the offensive line does have a good, a good, great game against Georgia State and are pushing Georgia State around, I'm not going to be as quick to to crown them uh, as I will be if they underperform against Georgia State, if that makes sense. And it's because Tennessee is supposed to look good against Georgia State. Tennessee is not supposed to look bad against Georgia State in the trenches. And, I mean, I just said a second ago, BYU, they're going to be much more of a challenge up front along the offensive line. I know this is more so for for the defense, but even relating it to, to BYU's front seven and what Tennessee's offensive line will go up against, BYU's front seven is going to be much more – physical much more tough uh they're they're going to have bigger bodies they're going to be well coached and and so that's going to be more of a test for tennessee than georgia state will be so i'm looking at the offensive line i'm looking at the defensive line Those, those will be really the only thing that i walk away from saturday's game having a strong take on is offensive line play and defensive line play Tennessee is supposed to, to smash Georgia State in the mouth, in the trenches, whether they're having a good year or whether they're having a bad year. And that's what I want to see on Saturday leading into next next week's BYU game against a physical football team. Another thing I, I really want to see from this team, and I, I think I, I think we both are right on this one, been on the, on the offensive line and defensive line. I think that's kind of the number one thing that everyone wants to see, all, all of all fans want to see, is how um, – do those two lines of scrimmage play for Tennessee because that's that's going to be key for UT's entire 2019 season is how well either of those units play. But I I also really want to see how these true freshmen who are going to play or, or who Tennessee is going to count on not just true freshmen that they're going to throw in there to get them some live action and in a game to see how they respond. I want to see how the true freshmen who Tennessee or they're going to have to be relying on this season play and that's that's actually quite a bit of guys and maybe not in the true freshman even you can count the newcomers of Savion Williams, Drell Middleton and, and Aubrey Solomon too if you want to throw him in there as well I want to see how all these newcomers at Tennessee how they're you know the ones they're going to rely on how they perform in their first action and obviously like I said this is far from an SEC caliber opponent this is even pretty far from what Tennessee is going to face against BYU next week but man you're going to see Ben it occurred to me the other day actually I think maybe yesterday how many true freshmen are, are likely to see playing time in this game and will likely be counted on to, to play some, you know, pretty pivotal snaps for Tennessee during the entire season. You have guys like Wanya Morris, Darnell Wright on offense. Those are probably the only two you're going to see. I mean, Ramel Keaton, I think, will kind of get into the receiving rotation. Um, I don't think he'll redshirt this year, but he won't obviously be counted on nearly to the extent of Wanya or, or Darnell. But you also have Eric Gray back there, who I think is going to play quite a bit. So I, I'm excited to see what he can do um, on offense for Tennessee. On defense, you have got you mentioned already earlier, Ben, Henry Tilatoa. I think Corvars Crouch is going to play a, a decent amount for Tennessee this year on defense and special teams both. Warren Burrell on, on, uh, the, in the secondary is a likely starter for Tennessee right now with Bryce Thompson being out. And maybe even if Bryce Thompson comes back, he still is going to be starting at you know at least the nickel spot. Um, but he's a guy that I, I'm very curious to watch and see what he can do. Um, you also have Elijah Simmons, who I – you know. He's going to be in that rotation in game one because Tennessee is going to play a ton of defensive linemen and offensive linemen week one against Georgia State. Um, but I, I am very curious to see kind of how his conditioning will hold up during the season. But I, I'm very curious to see him play in this first game and, and see what he brings to the table. So that's, I mean, that's just of true freshmen. That's what, seven, eight, nine guys right there that I, I just listed off that are true freshmen who are going to play in week one and who are likely going to be counted on as the season progresses to play either be a starter or play, you know, a, a decent amount of snaps at their positions. That's not even, it, that's not even covering some other guys. Like I said, the other newcomers like Savion Williams and Darrell Middleton, and Aubrey Solomon, the other true freshmen too, um, who are, who are going to play this season. It doesn't even counting some of those guys, you know, Tyus Fields and Jalen McCullough could work their way more into the secondary rotation. I, I don't think they probably will, but those are two guys I would circle on special teams as, as being, you know, if they don't redshirt this year, those two could play a lot of special team snaps for Tennessee. Um, I, they're just a lot of true freshmen. Roman Harrison's another guy that, like I said, I, I don't think he'll play as significant of a role as Henry Toa Toa or as Corberus Crouch. But I he I don't think he's going to redshirt. I, you know, I don't think he's going to be a guy that's just going to appear in four games and then sit out You know, the other uh, eight, for, or I guess nine, if they make a bowl game this year for Tennessee. I think Roman Harrison's going to be used in, in – 
special situations. He's a, a, a guy who I would love to see on special teams on the on the punt blocking and, and field goal blocking units. I, I think Rowan Harrison, I mean, he blocked a, a kick uh, for his high school team to help them continue playing and then eventually win a state title. I mean, he, he's a guy that I think just is built to kind of go out and wreak havoc as a true freshman, uh, just kind of turn loose and let him go. He's, he doesn't know all the defensive and stuff, and that's just going to come with time. But he's a guy who just has a lot of natural ability who I think could, you know, Makes the big plays just based off of his athleticism and what he brings to the table. But I, I think, to me, one of the other big things I want to watch for Tennessee this weekend is what these true freshmen look like because Tennessee's got a lot they're going to play, and they've got, they got a lot that they're going to count on this season. It, it's you know This isn't quite maybe to the level of the 2014 team where you look back at that 2014 team and you had – I mean, you did have a lot of freshman starters. You're going to have quite a few freshman starters here. I, I, I just don't think it's quite to the same level – of that 2014 uh, Tennessee team that had a lot of the true freshmen, but maybe I'm wrong. I'll, I'll be kind of curious to go back and once the season's over with, look at how many true freshmen played and started and stuff and kind of compare it uh, to that 2014 team. But I, I'm very curious to see how these new Vols and, and their first game action, how they look and, you know, do they live up to expectations? Do they, what, what Junior Pruitt has to say about them after the game and on his Monday press conference, after he's had time to watch the film. But I, I'm very curious, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of all fans are excited to watch, you know, the guys like Eric Gray, Henry Tolotoa, and Warren uh, Burel and their first action as Vols. Yeah, and I, I am looking forward to that. That's probably third on my list, though. Number one is line of scrimmage. Number two is who who's the backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. And not only who is the backup quarterback, but which of the two backups play better. Because I imagine both will play, and I, I hope it's a situation – to where both get an equal amount of playing time. And if they don't get an equal amount of playing time, if one gets more playing time than the other, that is going to tell me that one has indeed separated themselves from the other. But I don't think that will happen just based off of what Jeremy Pruitt said earlier this week in the sense of he thinks this is going to be an ongoing quarterback battle. Neither one has really separated themselves, and he could see this carrying on weeks into the season potentially. So... Uh, to me, that is concerning because history tells us at some point Jarek Garantano is going to get hurt based off of yeah. offensive line play. Uh, and, and so at that point, you need to know who you're, you're going to, you know, put in the game. And um, that that's a big question mark. And if bad luck strikes, it could be to prove the difference in Tennessee's football season. If J.T. Shroud or Brian Maurer isn't able to step up and take the reins and make some plays and lead Tennessee to wins um, – so that'll be what I'm looking forward uh, second most. The, the the second most and exciting thing I'm looking forward to seeing is JT Shroud in live action and Brian Maurer in live action. Because quite frankly, what we have been able to see in practice isn't enough to to form a legitimate opinion on the two. And uh, JT Shroud obviously has been on campus a, a year longer than Brian Maurer, but obviously he has not played yet. So. Uh, that would be the, the the second thing that I'm looking forward to the most and what I'm seeing this weekend. And then I'm with you uh, on, on the freshmen. That, that's the third thing I'm looking forward to this, this weekend is seeing how they respond to the live bullets. It's one thing to do well in practice. It's another to perform well in the game. And if Tennessee is going to reach its hopes and dreams this season, they are going to need the freshmen to step up and really play well. And when you think about it, there, there's a freshman at, every position on the team that is probably going to receive significant amount of playing time. Uh, you look at quarterback, the backup quarterback is going to receive a significant amount of playing time. Um, Eric Gray at running back, I'm, I'm excited to see if he, if he is legitimate. I think he is. I'm excited to see how he performs and how Jim Chaney uses him. At wide receiver, uh, over the last week or so, Romel Keaton has really made a move in the pecking order was running with the second team earlier this week in practice. I'm interested to see if he could have a big freshman impact. And then you look at the tight ends. Obviously you have Dominic Wood Anderson, uh, but then you have the two big six foot five, uh, the, the guys made of beef, Sean Brown and Jackson Lowe. And I don't know that those two will, will play a ton, but I imagine at some point, they will get an opportunity to make a couple plays, and I will be interested to see if they can take advantage of that. We know about the freshmen along the offensive line, Wanya Morris, Darnell Wright. Uh, I, I think those two are going to play a lot of football this year. I think anything less would be a disappointment. Uh, along the defensive line, that may be the one position where Tennessee is not going to be relying on freshmen. I, I guess uh, Elijah Simmons 
would be the most likely candidate um, because mm-hmm. Roman Harrison is playing outside linebacker and Elijah Simmons was working with the scout team this week in practice emulating uh, Georgia State's Perry Thomas along the defensive line. So that tells me that he is not going to receive any playing time um, or I should say a bunch of playing time early on. Uh, but the defensive line won't have any freshmen playing per se, but they will have newcomers playing. I think Darrell yes. Middleton is going to play a lot. I think definitely Savion Williams will play a lot. And then obviously there's Aubrey Solomon. Uh, and then at the linebacker, you talk about Henry Tolotoo. He's going to be starting. Um, I'm interested to see if J.J. Peterson can flash at all in any of these Georgia State, Tennessee, Chattanooga type games. I don't think that the coaching staff is going to throw him out there against BYU unless injuries happen because I don't think the coaching staff trusts him right now. And then also, how about Shannon Reed? He hasn't played a ton, but I'm excited to see what he can do. And then there's Jeremy Banks. Can Jeremy Banks, who just switched positions, can he have an impact um, as early as this week? And Jeremy Pruitt said on Wednesday night that, hey, he's ready to go. He, he has adjusted enough to where uh, he, he's ready to go. He's ready to play snaps. So I'm interested to see if he can have an impact. And then lastly, in the secondary, uh, you have Warren Burrell as the the primary newcomer that is going to receive a lot of playing time. I guess I'm really interested to see how Gerard Means looks. I, I mentioned him earlier, a converted wide receiver. The plan isn't even for him to remain at corner long term. Jeremy Pruitt said on Monday, I believe it was, that uh, the plan is for him to go back to wide receiver at some point, the position that he wants to play. To me, that is concerning that a guy who is a true freshman, he was flipped to corner midway through summer workout, and he's not even going to stay there long term. To me, that is concerning that he is your backup corner. That is very concerning to me, as is the case with Kenny Solomon, a true freshman. Uh, Nothing against him as football players, but that's not where you want to be in the SEC as a top football program. So, at each level of the defense and at each level of the offense, there's a bunch of new. So um, you you phrase it as, as freshman. I'll kind of adjust that and say I'm ready to see how the newness of this football team looks like. And honestly, that carries over into the coaching staff as well. Mm-hmm. Jim Cheney, Steve Martin, Derek Ansley, a new Jeremy Pruitt who has taken a step back. Let's see. It's one thing in practice and in team meetings to sit back and, and you know let your coaches coach, but hey. When the bullets are flying and it's a 24 to 21 game against BYU or against Florida, and the game's on the line, does he still have that same confidence in his coaches that they can get the job done without him overstepping his boundary and, and allowing them to do what they are being paid to do? So I'm interested to see all the newness of this Tennessee football team. Quick question for you, Ben, before um, we move along to our, our last topic here. You're, you're talking about Elijah Simmons there. Do you think he red shirts this upcoming season, or do you think he's going to be a guy that, that they, you know, with Arvis Solomon getting eligible, um, does that make it easier to redshirt him, or is he still a guy that you think, you know, why you think he's not probably going to see a whole lot of playing time maybe this week, but he's a guy they'll they'll count on as the season goes on? Because I, I I'm very curious about whether or not he's going to you know just play in four games this season and redshirt out because I I thought all along that he probably should, but then there was so much talk of him being the strongest guy on the team already and all sort of stuff in the in fall camp, but we haven't heard as much about him. So I, I'm I'm just curious before we move on, do you think he's going to redshirt this year? Uh, if you would have asked me at the be- after the first week of fall camp, I would have said no, just because of all the, the commentary on him that he's the strongest player on the team. And, you know, he was running with the first team a couple of days in practice and he was impressing and whatnot. I would have said no. I thought he would have played a big impact on this team. And he still may, but the fact that he was working with the scout team uh, this week, against Georgia State, I think that is very telling. Uh, I think he'll play in the four games that he can play in, and I think he will redshirt. So I think this month of September will be a big month for him. If he can take a step forward and prove that he can uh, make plays as a true freshman, I don't think he'll redshirt. But just based off of him being on scout team this week against Georgia State, uh, that leads me to believe that maybe redshirting is in the plans for Elijah Simmons. So those were my, my thoughts on him initially. Like I said, when you, in the summer and stuff, and even or like when we got to fall camp, I thought surely he's going to redshirt this year. And then we, you know, started like you said, we heard more about him. Um, that he got praised for being one of the strongest guys, if not the strongest guy on the team already as a true freshman. And like you said, he was getting some run with some of the first team stuff and was looking, 
you know, pretty good the start of fall camp. But I think, you know, once they got the full pads and stuff on, I remember um, kind of, I think it was the second week or it, it was maybe, I think, within the first week of fall camp. Um, he was having some conditioning issues. I'll, I'll put it at that. He, he was not having, he didn't have a, a, a very fun, very good practice. At one of the, the, I think one of the practices of that first week of fall camp, but I think it's a high seed. That is not, you know, just because you're not going to play a whole lot as a true freshman or your redshirt as a true freshman doesn't mean, you know, you're not going to be a good player or whatever. Um, I, I personally think Elijah Simmons has a very high ceiling, very high future at Tennessee, but they just may not need him um, as much right now as a few weeks ago because you do have Ari Solomon eligible. And obviously, those two don't play the same position. You, 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 Simmons is playing nose guard or nose tackle, or however you want, however you want to word it, and it's looking like Greg Emerson is going to be the starter there. Um, but maybe he does. Maybe he serves as a backup role. But like you said, him being on scout team makes me think um, that he's not going to play a whole lot this week. If he's not going to play a whole lot against Georgia State, then I, I, I just unless there are injuries or unless some guys aren't performing like they want them to, I just don't see him performing or playing a whole lot against you know BYU or or, or Florida or Missouri when the season's down in November. So we'll see. But I, I just want your thoughts on that really quickly. Now let's move on here to the last little bit of our. RTI podcast here on the the first 24 hour 48 hour uh, deadline of of Tennessee's season the game week here the game's on Saturday kickoff is soon Ben it's not just kickoff for Tennessee though there are a lot of teams playing their first games of the season we already saw one SEC team in Florida take on Miami last weekend and that was a it was a entertaining game for the fact that it was a close game and the fact that I really didn't know who was going to win for a while there but it was not entertaining in the fact that it was pretty awful in some aspects. I mean, Miami gave up 10 sacks. It seemed like every time Williams was back uh, to pass, he had a – it looked like what Tennessee's offensive line was doing last year. It just seemed like every time he's back to pass, within a second of him uh, getting the, the snap from the center, there was a guy in his face. Or, or with the running running backs, there was there were, you know, guys all over them and everything. It, it just was – not fun to watch. Florida's offense was not very fun to watch either. Uh, Felipe Franks turned the ball over. I think he was what responsible for four turnovers, two picks, and, and two fumbles of the fumbled snap. And a, I mean, he, he had a bad game. And somehow Florida still won that game. And he also had the buff punt by Miami. That just it was it was a you know it was a week one game. It was a game where you could tell these two teams um, were working out the kinks and everything. But this weekend is not just kickoff for Tennessee. We're going to see a lot of Tennessee's 2019 opponents in action as well. Ben, we also have a, a, a well, it's, not, it's not a marquee SEC matchup, but it's an, it's, it's an SEC matchup in week one, which does, doesn't happen very often. We have Vanderbilt and Georgia playing. You've got some other big-time matchups uh, across the board for the SEC. So, Ben, I'm going to throw it over to you. You're kind of our, you know, I keep up with the SEC, obviously, but you're kind of our uh, resident, you know, keeping up with the what's going around around the SEC kind of guy. Uh, you, you know quite a bit about the other teams in the SEC who Tennessee's going to be taking on, and you're a very well-rounded uh, knowledgeable guy when it comes to those teams, and you know that's why I, that's why I trust some of the things you had to say about Tennessee's opponents and, and what you think about them more than um, a lot of other people who who cover Tennessee football. But what are some things you're keeping an eye on this weekend as it pertains to you know a future opponents? It could be it could be other things too. It could be you know things that won't even affect Tennessee. But I'm curious what else this weekend you are keeping an eye on. Well, first off, I appreciate the kind words. Um, mm-hmm. That's very nice of you. Uh, honestly. I mentioned it earlier, but the the one thing that I am most looking forward to isn't even in the SEC, and it's the BYU Utah State game tonight. I think that that should be the the one game that every Tennessee fan is paying attention to. Uh, I kind of I won't go through it as I did earlier, but uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm very high on BYU's offense and their potential. Uh, the the makings of a good offensive line, it appears, uh, a good young quarterback and Zach Wilson return eight of their top ten pass catchers and their best one is a is a tight end they have three running backs that are capable of getting the job done so um, that's the that is the one thing I'm looking forward to the most this weekend as it pertains to Tennessee because of, of Tennessee's perceived weaknesses right now it is the offensive line and the defensive line and it appears that BYU is going to be strong in the trenches and on offense and uh, they have some young, promising players on defense, although they are not very experienced, or do they? Or they they don't enter this season with a lot of production in the past. So, they, BYU is going up against a tremendous Utah team, and, and I think it'll be very telling 
uh, on BYU of how they perform against Utah. I, I I will be nervous for the Tennessee BYU game if you, if BYU comes out tonight and has a strong showing against Utah because I, I'm very high on Utah, and if the BYU offense can can live up to my personal hype, then that is going to worry me. Uh, for next week's game against Tennessee, especially if Tennessee's defensive line does not look good against Georgia State this weekend. So that is the one thing that I'm looking forward to uh, con- considering Tennessee. Uh, the one thing not pertaining to Tennessee is the Auburn-Oregon game. Mm-hmm. That game is going to be fun, uh, and I'm so happy that it is not at the same time as the Tennessee game. That It's just such an interesting matchup. It's what Oregon does really well. Auburn can counter that, and it's what they do really well, and vice versa. Auburn's defensive line may be the best defensive line in the country, but Oregon has the most experienced returning offensive line in the country, and they have one of the best quarterbacks in the country, not named Tua Tungavailoa, not named Trevor Lawrence, in Justin Herbert. And if we know anything about a Mario Cristobal team, it's that they're going to be strong up front along the offensive line, It's that they're going to be strong and tough all over, especially on defense. So Auburn is starting a a true freshman quarterback. I'm interested to see how that goes. And then I'm kind of interested to see how Vanderbilt does against Georgia. Uh, Right now it's a 22-point spread. I don't think Vanderbilt comes close to winning, but they they do have a, 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 you know, a trio of great players and Jared Pinckney and Kalijah Lipscomb and, uh, Keyshawn Vaughn, I, I'm interested to see if they can carry Vanderbilt uh, and, and how Vanderbilt's new quarterback, whether it be Deuce Wallace, the Severeville native, or whether it be Riley Neal, the Ball State transfer. I'm interested to see how, how those guys perform. Uh, South Carolina and North Carolina play. Jake Bentley is 1-10 in, in big-time college football games during his career, and, and that's 1-10 in 10 against top 25 teams I should say North Carolina is not a top 25 team but that is a game in which Jake Bentley should do well Matt Brown is kind of you know rebuilding that North Carolina team and then there's some funky games in the SEC Missouri is playing at Wyoming like why is Missouri playing at Wyoming on what earth are we living on in which Missouri is playing at Wyoming Missouri should handle that game with ease and then Mississippi State is playing Louisiana Lafayette uh in, in the Superdome and that is weird to me. Uh, I, I get that it's at a neutral site, but it's almost like a, a home game for Louisiana Lafayette. That is weird to me, as I mentioned. Uh, and then I guess the one game that I am not mentioning, uh, the the other big one that I'm looking at is Ole Miss at Memphis. Memphis yeah, is five and a half point favorite. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm excited. That could be <laughs> Ole Miss and Memphis, BYU, Utah, Auburn, Oregon are the three games that I am really paying attention to outside of the Tennessee game. I'm, I'm interested to see – if Memphis can live up to the hype. Last time I checked, they were favorite. They were the favorite in every single game that they play this year, and they have high expectations uh, this year. And Ole Miss is returning a terrible defense, returned very little experience on offense, two new coordinators, a new a new quarterback in Matt Corral. So I'm interested to see how that goes. And then I'll give you one more because I think that uh, – I'll give you two more just real quick. Uh, Fresno State at USC – 10 o'clock, 10.30 on, uh, on Saturday night. Fresno State went 12-2 and two last season. USC had its first losing season in nearly 20 years, went 5-7. and seven. That could be a situation uh, where Clay Helton, USC's head coach, uh, could, could – they're not going to fire him after week one, but if they lose to Fresno State, I could see a situation in where USC is firing Clay Helton at the end of September, three to four games in. Uh, it could get bad there. And then the other one that is a similar scenario is Florida State playing Boise State now in Tallahassee. That game was supposed to be played in Jacksonville, but because of the hurricane uh, that is coming in this weekend, it was moved to noon uh, in Tallahassee. Boise State was a 10-win team last season. Florida State was abysmal. They have a terrible offensive line. Boise State is starting a four-star quarterback who's a freshman and returned all five offensive linemen. So if that is that Florida State game is similar to the USC one, where if Florida State loses to Boise State, Florida State fans are going to be upset with Willie Taggart. So those are kind of the games that I'm looking forward to uh, this weekend. Those are all really good. Like the games, been you said, the SEC has some good matchups, and they have some just kind of weird ones. That 
Old Miss Memphis game is, is going to be one that I, I'm very much looking forward to seeing that won't have any kind of implication or any kind of you know effect on Tennessee's season, but I'm, I'm going to keep up with it. That's a noon kickoff. Um, it, Alabama Duke, I wish that was a better matchup than what it's going to be because that, that, that I would love to see Devin Cutcliffe you know, play Alabama close, but there, he's getting Alabama. Any, any time to get Alabama is bad for Duke. But he's giving him potentially the worst possible time he could get could be getting him with with a transcendent you know a once in a every ten fifteen years type of quarterback and, and Tua over there with the the bevy of just talented receivers they have with the great defense they have and him losing Daniel Jones already and with Alabama having the chip on their shoulder of losing the title game last year it's not going to go well for David Cutcliffe against Alabama if this had been a few years ago maybe it would have been a different story. It, obviously, Duke still was, is going to lose that game if this was played three or four years ago, but it would be a little more intriguing. Uh, right now, it's just going to be a bloodbath, and I, I feel sorry for Cut and, and Duke. But there, there are some very intriguing matchups in the SEC. Like you said, there, there are several nationally um, that Vol fans, maybe you know the diehard college football fans that are Vol fans would know about, but maybe not the casual Vol fan. Like you said, the USC Fresno State uh, one uh, for an example there. But I'm also very much, like you said, looking forward to Boise State. I, I, I've known, you know, it's it kind of goes, without being said almost, how just kind of consistently good Boise State's been over the last, I mean, well over essentially two decades at this point. You go back to 1999, they've won 10 games in all but, like, I think four or five seasons over the last 20 years. So they, they've just been very, very good. Obviously, they haven't played in, in a, you know, premier conference the Mount West might actually be the best conference they've been in, um, and it's still not a great conference overall. So, but they're just a very good team that I, I've always been a you know kind of a tertiary fan of Boise State because I mean growing up they were that's when they were kind of really good. I remember watching them uh, win in the Fiesta Bowl against Oklahoma back in 2006. That was a really fun uh, game to to, to watch. Uh, that was the the old Statue of Liberty play that happened. I remember they beat TCU in the Fiesta Bowl um, in 2009. I mean, they've just been consistently one of those teams you're always saying, hey, they're good. And they also obviously caught attention because of their uh, blue field as well. So I'll be very curious to see what they do uh, just because I've always liked keeping up with Boise State. But I think that'll go ahead and do it for this episode of the podcast. Hopefully you got a lot of information out of it from uh, our, our takedown Georgia State, what we want to see from the game. If you want to see more coverage and kind of get more of a better of a better feel of what to expect from Georgia State, our full opponent preview is on the website at rockytopinsider.com. It's just the opponent preview. Georgia State has a breakdown of all their, retur- their leading returning uh, players from last season, uh, what, th- what to kind of look at on offense, what to look at on defense, what to look at at special teams. Ben and I are going to fill out our season predictions, and they should be out on Thursday night. If not, it'll be at the absolute latest. It'll be Friday morning. Um, that should be sometime Thursday night. We're going to do a buy or sell piece on Friday as well for the game, You know, buying and selling what's going to happen in the game, and also buying and selling what's going to happen what we believe will happen uh, during Tennessee's 2019 season. So it, that'll be kind of a fun piece that we did a little bit last year. I don't think we kept up with it consistently, but we're going to try to this year and do a buy or sell piece before every single week's game. So we're going to have full previews of the opponent, full previews of the game, our season predictions, and then a buy or sell piece. And if any other news breaks or happens, uh, we've got kind of the main ones out of the way with, with Trey Smith, Aubrey Salmon. I don't think you're going to hear anything about Bryce Thompson for a while. Um, so we kind of got that, kind of got all the breaking news out of the way. So it should just be kind of focusing on the game, focusing on this weekend, and then of course we'll have all kinds of content for you after the game on Saturday night, on Sunday, and then kind of recapping stuff on Monday as well. But signing off for Ben McKee, I'm Nathaniel Rutherford of RocketTopInsider.com, and this has been another episode of the RTI Podcast.